this week we're going to be talking about swords and that's so tiny i'm not even sure you can see them on the video swords <laughs> this is my son's foil he does fencing for sports and he let me borrow this to show you guys this is not at all what would have happened or been used regularly in the 16th century but it is a nice visual example of ooh, fencing the modern sport of fencing got its start back in the 16th and 17th century or at least it was building its popularity then there were huge famous italian fencing masters who brought the art to england and people like shakespeare would have carried around a rapier so this week we're asking the question did shakespeare carry a sword quick accuracy correction here the modern day sport of fencing officially got its start in 18th century france when the foil was invented by saying that it got its start in the 16th and 17th century what i mean is that you can see a development societally and culturally across europe of people using a small sword for thrusting and dueling which would later develop into the modern sport of fencing if you look at this one this is a foil and this blade is if you look at it way up close let's see if i can get it so you can see it it's a rectangle shape and it's very dull obviously it's designed to be used for students my son is eight and so this is his sword and it's for eight-year-olds it's not going to hurt kill or maim anyone the popularity of the rapier which is a lighter smaller dueling sword its popularity ironically coincides pretty directly with Shakespeare's lifetime. Now I don't give Shakespeare any credit for the rapier, it's just coincidental and ironic that this would coincide with his lifetime. But the popularity of the rapier in England lasted from about 1550 until 1630, just long enough for it to be popular in England when Shakespeare was writing famous fencing scenes like Hamlet. At the end of Hamlet in Act Five, Hamlet and Laertes are involved in what's called a gentleman's duel. Now, the reason that matters is because in a gentleman's duel, the swords were supposed to be blunted. They weren't supposed to kill your opponent. So when Laertes attacks Hamlet, Hamlet knows he's been betrayed when he first gets injured. Now, there is one line in the play itself about rapiers, which completely changes how you will stage this scene. And the line comes in scene two when Orsic announces the weapons they'll be using in the duel. He says rapier and dagger. The rapier and dagger is a very specific method. It was put in a book by Capofero. You may remember Rodolfo Capofero from the movie The Princess Bride when Inigo and the men in black are having their duel. They are throwing back and forth famous fencing terms like Capofero, Tybalt, and Bonetti. These three men were the famous fencing masters who were informing the correct way to use a rapier when Shakespeare was writing his plays. The funny thing about the rapier being used in Hamlet is that Hamlet is supposedly set in and around the 1400s in Denmark, which did not have the rapier at that time. So it's inauthentic on Shakespeare's part, he is not being historically accurate, to have the fight be held with the rapier and dagger. Instead, Shakespeare is true to Shakespeare's form, paying attention first to his audience and second to the context of his play. Because the rapier and dagger method of dueling was one of the three most popular methods of dueling in England when this play was being staged. So the audience would have recognized this method. So when Orsic comes out and says, they're going to use a rapier and a dagger. The audience would have known exactly what was about to appear on stage. They would have known the methods and the presentation of this fight. So Shakespeare was really playing to his audience with this method. Around the year 1500, the rapier came to be a thing. Now, when I'm doing my research on the rapier, there's a little bit of confusion as to whether the word is actually French or German, um, but the word itself, rapier, came into use in around 1500. It was designed to be a civilian dress sword. It wasn't something people would carry in the military. It was what a gentleman would carry should he be called to defend his honor in a duel. It was primarily a thrusting sword as opposed to a cutting sword. Now the details 
and differences between that are just basically the method of killing a person. It's pretty gory, but the rapier was designed to be a thrusting weapon. You were going to stab them and they would die. That was the method. If you look back through some of the books Capifero published, you'll see illustrations of these fights and the person with the rapier would stab their opponent actually through the head because that kills them when you go through their head. And so it was a thrusting method. Ugh, that's awful. But that's what it was. The rapier had a small blade less than one inch in width and was popular in Italy, which is why the books published in England during Shakespeare's lifetime were by Italian masters. This was coming over to England from Europe. Some historical accounts say that the English were initially very hesitant, I suppose you could say. Some go as far as to uh, suggest they were actually repulsed or actively opposed to the use of the rapier. But what we can know is that from about 1550 to 1610, there was a lot of confusion about what the right way to use a rapier was. There were different methods of thought, there were different approaches to fencing, and different people thought you should do different ways. A man named Agrippa which was also mentioned in The Princess Bride. Agrippa was one who applied sacred geometry to the art of fencing. And that's why I think, as far as Shakespeare, he was probably most likely influenced by Agrippa because the timing fits. Capifero didn't publish his book until 1610, which was a full decade after Hamlet had been first staged. Hamlet was first staged around 1600 or 1601. Historians aren't sure which year it actually was. Uh, most lean towards 1601, but anyway, sometime right in there. And so Capifero's book was published a full decade after that. So it probably wasn't Capifero that influenced Hamlet specifically, but Agrippa probably definitely influenced it as well as a little bit of Bonetti. In 1570, Bonetti brought the rapier to England as a dueling sword. It was extremely popular throughout Europe as a gentleman's weapon. The wealthy, the nobles, the upper class, or someone that wanted to seem upper class would carry this weapon. There's a picture in the 1580s of Sir Walter Raleigh and his son, and both of them, and his son looks quite young. His, as far as his height, he doesn't quite come up to his father's shoulder yet, but he's still got his rapier strapped to his side like he is fully dressed. He looks like a little copy of his father and they you are both carrying this rapier so it was very popular as a civilian dress weapon it was a form of defense for a civilian we think here in the United States of dueling I know Ben Johnson got in trouble for dueling Christopher Marlowe obviously got in severe trouble with the dueling and in my mind when you read those stories the first time it's easy to think of American history and cowboys and dueling being they you know, took out their pistols and shot each other. Well, in Elizabethan times, they didn't have pistols, but they did carry around these rapiers. And so you would get, or you could get challenged to a duel and have to defend your honor. And it would be over minor, minor things. And so it was almost a rite of passage. Fathers would be like, you have to carry this because if someone challenges you to a duel, you have to be able to defend yourself. And so there was this macho manly aspect to it as well and people got so carried away with showing off their rapiers and the length of the rapiers and all of this that in 1566 queen elizabeth actually passed a edict or a declaration that said your rapier could be no longer than 40 and a half inches which is somewhere between three and four feet it's about three and a half feet but it couldn't be any longer than that and if you were caught with a rapier that was longer than that, whether you were wearing it or it was just in your house, if you owned it and it was longer than the prescribed length, you were risking prison time and being fined over this. So people were taking it quite seriously at the time. By 1715, the rapier had been replaced by the small sword almost completely. It started to fall out of fashion in the late 1630s, but by 1715, you'll see it mentioned in a few treaties and different publications you'll see the rapier mentioned but by and large people were carrying the small sword much more than they were the rapier by then it wasn't quite the fashionable weapon so for shakespeare's lifetime and the plays that he was writing the rapier was really popular but it's quite interesting to me that as far as the history of swords this particular sword in england only enjoyed popularity for about 50 years tybalt who is the other sword master we've mentioned was for example popular around 1630. So his methods would have been popular after Shakespeare. Um, there's a man named Swetnam who published things earlier in the 1600s, as well as Saviolo was popular in England around the 1590s. So why does this matter for Hamlet? In the scene, 
of Act 5, Scene 2 of the play Hamlet when Hamlet and Laertes are dueling. A lot of times you'll see this portrayed on stage or in film as if Hamlet is surprised to discover that he's been betrayed. Now, if he was using a rapier and dagger, that makes it pretty unlikely he wasn't aware of what was going on, and here's why. The rapier and dagger method allowed for a particular fighting approach called the left hand seizure, which is basically where you use the rapier and dagger in tandem, one in one hand, one in the other, to remove the weapon from your opponent. You block their strike and then remove their sword from them. Now, when Laertes injures Hamlet, Hamlet knows he's been betrayed. So when he is attacking Laertes, he is personally motivated to remove Laertes' weapon from him. Now, we don't have any indication in the text of whether or not Hamlet was aware the blade had been poisoned, but the method of fighting suggests that Hamlet does know that he's been betrayed. Now, the reason that matters is because most of the time you'll see an epee blade used on stage. These are easier to get, they're lighter, and they're a little bit safer for stage fight, just to be practical. So when you're seeing it staged with an epee blade, an attack method with the epee is to dislodge the sword from your opponent. So when you're fighting, you will dislodge the sword and it'll fling away. So you may have seen Hamlet played out where in this fight, Laertes accidentally loses his sword, which Hamlet then picks up you know, and it's just fortuitous that he did this. Well, if they were using the rapier and dagger method and the forms of fighting that were popular in the 16th century, it's far more likely that Hamlet knew exactly what was going on and that removing Laertes' weapon from him was intentional. So this one line in the play and a brief history of the rapier in England in the 1500s lets you know where Shakespeare's mind was at and what he would have written into Hamlet's mind for that scene. If you're really into swords, you'll also find it interesting that from 1570 until 1630, the swept hilt was popular in England at this time. Now, a hilt is, is this part right here that protects your hand. And on a rapier, it looks like a cage. It looks like a bunch of metal that makes a cage over your hand. And there's a kind that sweeps back over your hand to protect it, and that's called a swept hilt. And it was popular right at the time Hamlet was being staged. So if you're staging Hamlet in film or on the stage and you want to be incredibly accurate, you will use a swept hilt rapier, dulled point, mind you, so that it doesn't kill anyone. So in answering this week's question of did Shakespeare carry a sword, yes. Um, it's highly likely that Shakespeare would have, in fact, carried a sword based on where he was working and who his patrons were and the social status that he enjoyed by the time Hamlet was being staged. Yeah, it's likely that Shakespeare carried a sword because it was the popular, fashionable thing to do of someone in his social status. So while we don't know for sure, because there aren't like, you know, photographs of him, you know, the paparazzi didn't catch him wearing a sword or anything, it's just we do know that it was popular where he was, when he was, for his social class. And obviously he was very familiar with them because he wrote them into 15 of his plays. Draw your own conclusions, but that's the history of Shakespeare, Rapiers, and Hamlet. That'll do it for this week here at Did Shakespeare. I'm that Shakespeare girl, Cassidy Cash. Thank you so much for being here. As always, if you like this video, please hit like and subscribe. And I'll see you guys next week with even more Shakespeare fun. Bye-bye.